Greetings, and as you probably gathered, our focus this week is on group selection. <laughs> and in the presentation that follows, you'll be learning more about it, including what is called cultural group selection. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. This presentation is called The Return of the Group. And in the revival of group selection, there's two Wilsons involved, and we need to sort them out. One is Edward O. Wilson, who founded Social Biology, and his entry into the group selection debate is the social conquest of Earth, where he downplays the significance of Hamilton's rule and argues that our altruism must be explained by group selection. Another Wilson is David Sloan Wilson. And we're going to be focusing on just one of his books, his recent work called Darwin's Cathedral, which tries to give an evolutionary account of religion based on cultural group selection. So in Wilson's view, evolutionary theory's wrong turn was the 1960s consensus among evolutionary biologists calling themselves neo-Darwinians. And the heart of that consensus was a rejection of group selection. So what was group selection? Well, we've already discussed this. And meeting at Grand Central defines it as the idea that selection acts most strongly through the differential survival and re reproduction of entire groups. And we've also reviewed uh, in a prior presentation the Neo-Darwinian critique of group selection, the consensus that formed, the first principle being that the interest of individuals within groups don't necessarily coincide, so we should expect conflicts of interest between individuals within groups. The second principle is that what is best for the individual is not necessarily what is best for the group and vice versa, so we should expect conflicts between individual interest and group interest. And the third principle then is that we should expect those individual conflicts and interests to prevail over group interest, and we should only reach beyond the gene if we have to. And that's a paraphrase of George Williams' position that adaptation shouldn't involve explanations at any higher level than is necessary. So according to David Sloan Wilson, the whole cell rejection of group selection was a wrong turn from which the field is only beginning to recover, and his remedy for this is a new and improved group selection. And we as Americans love things that are new and improved. So what is it that's so new and improved about David Sloan Wilson's group selection? Well, uh, the new group selection is multi-level, and this is the key to it. And Edward O. Wilson uh, stated this is an iron rule. And, of course, you're probably associating with iron rule a mighty fist or something, but I thought the little iron was a nicer touch. So Edward O. Wilson's iron rule is that an iron rule exists in genetic social evolution Selfish individuals beat out altruistic individuals, while groups of altruists beat groups of selfish individuals. Within the groups, the selfish individuals will beat the altruist, but between the groups, the altruist will beat the selfish. So how can this possibly work? Not everyone agrees it can. Uh, David Sloan Wilson identifies four steps that we need to take. First, we must identify relevant trait groups. Um, secondly, we then compare the fitness of individuals within those groups in regard to that trait. 
Third, we compare the fitnesses of the groups of individuals within the population as a whole, and then we tally up the combined within and between group outcomes. So that's a certain procedure uh, that you must follow if you're going to see group selection in action. And it's a, a problematic procedure in some ways. So let's imagine this. We have two groups. We marked one as a greater cooperating group and one is a lesser cooperating group using green and red. So over here in the green group, let's say that we have three cooperators and one defector. So in that group, 75% cooperators. In this other group, we have just one cooperator and three defectors. So in that group, 75% of defectors. Overall, the population, if we put both the groups together, it's 50-50. So there's different ways that we can work this outcome. Uh, and let's use an example here, very much an invented example of Kalahari meerkats. We're going to simplify tremendously uh, the analyses that have been done of their sentry duty and calling warnings when predators are in the area. So in group A, we have three callers, we'll say, who will warn each other of predators and one non-caller who will remain quiet and just keep eating. So let's say that what happens is that the non-caller uh, manages to free ride and just keep eating while the uh, callers uh, take a risk. But in this model, our first run of it, let's say that everyone survives. And in that case, uh, the free rider has gained a free ride, um, but everyone else has survived as well. In group B over here, we have just one caller and three non-callers. And let's say that the collar is eaten first, and eagle swoops down and eats the sentry. And the rest of them aren't paying any attention, so then the eagle eats the rest of them. And that group is wiped out. Well, if this scenario happened, right, if this is true, we've gone from a population of 50% collars, uh, four collars and four non-collars, if we added both of those groups together, uh, to a population of 75% callers, uh, three out of the four. And let's say that they doubled in number, uh, then we have six out of eight uh, callers, assuming that their uh, offspring inherit their uh, tendencies. So that's one way the math might work. However, Wilson argues that within groups, uh, the cheaters will prevail. So now let's say, what if the non-caller free rides and one of the callers is eaten by an eagle, the rest get away, as does the cheater. So now we erase an individual within that group. And then let's say in the next uh, run of things, another individual, one of the callers is eaten. Um, the question here that's long been made by neo-Darwinians is won't the frequency of the non-callers simply rise within all of the groups and how do we ever get those callers to such a high percentage in one group as opposed to another in the first place? Well this isn't uh, easy to see. So what is required uh, for this to work? Well the first thing is that there have to be differences between the groups that have fitness consequences. Uh, in group A, we have three callers and one non-caller. In group B, one caller and three non-callers. We need that in order to have group selection. There has to be significant variation between groups in behaviors that have fitness consequences. The groups have to have a different composition. Secondly, the groups of cooperators have to be able to replace groups of cheaters uh, through the destruction of the latter, either at the hands of predators or starvation, or maybe competition between the groups. So something has to happen uh, to eliminate uh, groups of cheaters. And lastly, somehow those groups of cooperators have to get started in the first place, and they have to manage to control or eliminate the cheaters in their midst. So all of these things arguably have to happen for group selection to work. 
And one of them, the first one we had, is that there have to be differences between groups that have fitness consequences greater than the differences among the individuals within the groups. And this makes this approach called biological group selection problematic when we try to apply it to humans. And why is that? Well, we've got this idea of race that uh, there's meaningful genetic differences between groups of people, but it doesn't turn out to work so well when we look at the distribution of genetic variation. Because all humans alive today have recent common ancestry within the last 60,000 years, 99.9% .9 of the human genome is invariant. So overwhelmingly, uh, every human alive today, in fact, has the same uh, alleles, the same genes, and the same genomes. If we focus in on that one-tenth of one percent of the genome that does vary, then we find that 85% of the variation is found in all races, and we're defining those in that case at a very local level, uh, basically at the level of what are called ethnicities. So we're not comparing Africa to Europe to Asia. If we do that, 96% of the variation is found within those groups. If we take it all the way down uh, to nationalities and ethnicities, 85% of the variation is still found within all of the groups. And that's why we have races marked in quotes. A third massive fact is that the variation between individuals within human races greatly exceeds the variation between the races as groups. So uh, that uh, little photo we put up, race, are we so different? Uh, no, we're not uh, when it comes to genetic variability. And so this should make humans bad candidates uh, for biological group selection. Right, uh, race, as uh, anthropologists and biologists continually stress, is a poor way to think about human variation. Now here's a quandary. We're bad candidates for biological group selection from a genetic perspective, but we don't let that get in the way of our warfare and our genocide and our ethnocentrism. In other words, we very much act like organisms that have been selected uh, by group selection in some way. So how did this happen? Well, a what if, another uh, theory on this is that it's not genetic uh, biological group selection, but it's learned cultural group selection. So what if cultural adaptations to varied local conditions can generate individual conformity within groups and differences between them uh, that result in uh, behavioral variation falling mostly between groups. So if cultural learning has that power, then what we call cultural group selection might be possible. And because it's cultural group selection, we should expect it to be rather arbitrary in how the boundaries are determined and this is something that's long been noted about ethnic, ethnicities and nationalities as well as racial groupings is how arbitrary they are. So we know that there's a psychology associated with groups. Uh, one aspect of this is punishing deviance within groups and insisting on conformity. In American culture, one expression of this is makeovers. Uh, where we take individuals and make them look more like our cultural ideals, and then we applaud them for giving up their individuality. Another aspect of this, uh, the psychology of groups, is an emphasis on borders between these arbitrarily defined cultural groups. And this is marked by a strong emphasis on patriotism uh, among the members of a group and ethnocentrism between them. So that love of country turns into hatred of the other, and these things seem to go together. So cultural group selection is associated, presumably, or it should be, with pressures towards conformity within, and maybe that in some way helps to ensure cooperation within groups, and also borders between and conflicts between these groups uh, which would allow one group to replace another one uh, through genocide. 
So could it be that ethnocentrism is a psychological adaptation to cultural group formation? That as humans came to rely more and more on cultural learning, we were able to form groups that competed with one another, uh, not because of our genetic variation, but because of that very cultural variation. And cultural differences became the fuel that shaped our psychology in a way that is so sensitive uh, to group groupness. And certainly anthropology, uh, we have many images of varying cultures. And what we see is both the striking differences between cultures and also the uniformity, the conformity within them. So back to our uh, metaphor here, uh, does this take us out of the frying pan and into the fire? Again, the frying pan is individual competition within groups, uh, the selection among individuals for reproductive advantage. But going from the frying, frying pan to the fire, uh, this is competition between groups. And presumably this is what uh, fuels our wars and makes them possible. Our willingness to believe that the members of another group are evil and need to be destroyed or they will destroy us. Um, that then leads to various kinds of genocide of which warfare is one expression. And uh, all of it is supported by ethnocentrism, which we could define as a, a willingness to believe the worst about the members of other groups. Thank you for listening.